سنريهم آياتنا في الآفاق وفي أنفسهم هذا أغرب وأغرب ماذا يوجد في أنفسنا من آيات بيوكاي اكتشف أنه توجد آية خارقة للعادة آية العلق لكن كان من كان يدري أنه في أنفسنا For the Quran, I, I see that uh, I, I could not find uh, something in contradiction with science. What, for you particularly, impressed you personally? What appeared in the Quran concerning physiology and reproduction? In his search for scientific signs in the Quran, Dr. Bukai had found out that precise mechanisms and clearly defined stages of human reproduction are detailed in many passages. Those are described in simple terms and in strict accordance with what was to be discovered much later on. لولا أن أحد الفنانين الإيطاليين استطاع أن يدخل كاميرا دقيقة للغاية في رحم امرأة حامل وصور هذه المراحل جاءت مطابقة مطابقة دقيقة لوصف القرآن الكريم لها. Having categorized his scientific conclusions, Bukai indicates that fertilization is performed by only a very small volume of liquid, a fact repeated in the Quran 11 times. The Arabic word nutfa comes from a verb meaning to dribble, a drop, to trickle. Here it signifies the sperm because the word is associated in another verse with the word sperm. Verse 37, chapter 75. Was he not nutfa? A mere sperm drop from mania, an emitted semen. Another verse indicates that the small quantity in question ends up in a firmly established lodging, korar, which obviously means the genital organs. Verse 13, chapter 23. Then we made him nutfa, a sperm drop, set in korar makin, a well-established place. Bukai points out that although the words Qur'ar Makin are hardly translatable, yet they could read a safe and firmly established lodging. That is the spot where a man grows in the maternal organisms. Indeed, it is we alone who have created man from a nutfa, a sperm drop, amshaj, of mingled fluid, to try him in life. Thus did we make him a being endowed with hearing and seeing. Amshaj is the Arabic word for mingled fluid. Propelled by a certain medical enthusiasm, Bukai continues to tell us about the spermatic liquid which is formed by various secretions coming from four glands, starting with the testicles. The secretion of the male genital gland containing spermazoon, the elongated cells with a long flagellum, second gland, the seminal vesicles, are the reservoirs of spermazoon. The prostate gland comes in third as it secretes a liquid that gives the sperm its creamy texture and characteristic odor. Finally, the glands annex to the urinary tract, coopers or maries, which secrete a stringy liquid and latres glands that give off mucus. These are the origins of the mingled liquids, amshaj, the Quran is referring to. There is, however, more to be said on this subject when the Quran tells us about a fertilizing liquid composed of different components, it also informs us that man's progeny will be maintained by something which may be extracted from this liquid. The Arabic word, translated here by the word quintessence, is sulala. It signifies something which is extracted, the issue of something else. A crystal clear reference to what is known today as in vitro fertilization or IVF. This is the meaning of verse 8, chapter 32. Then he made his progeny from Sulala, a quintessence of humble fluid drawn forth. Bukai continues explaining basic embryology. Fertilization of the egg and reproduction are produced by a cell that is very elongated. Its dimensions are measured in ten thousands of a millimeter. In normal conditions, only one single cell among several tens of millions produced by a male will actually penetrate the oval. 
A large number of them are left behind and never complete the journey which leads from the vagina to the oval, passing through the uterus and fallopian tubes. It is therefore an infinitesimally small part of the extract from a liquid whose composition is highly complex which actually fulfills its function. In consequence, it is difficult not to be struck by the agreement between the text of the Quran and the scientific knowledge we possess today of these phenomena. Bukai describes the process of the implantation of the egg. Once the fertilized egg has been in the fallopian tube, it descends to lodge inside the uterus. The Quran names the lodging of the fertilized egg in the womb in verse 5, chapter 22. Thus do we cause to settle in the wombs of their mothers, whatever unborns we so will. For a stated term, then we bring you forth as children. نحن لم نكتشف إلا في هذه الساعات القريبة جدا أن الإنسان خلق من تعليق بيضة قد وقع إخصابها في رحم الأم فكتب أول ما كتب دراسة عن تكوين الجنين في القرآن وهي تطابق العلم الحديث تماما وبعث برسالته هذه إلى المجمع الطبي الفرنسي وهذا قد قاله هو لي بنفسي The original meaning of the Arabic word alak is something which clings The act of clinging is described five times in the Quran starting with verses 1 and 2 chapter 96 Read, O Prophet, in the name of your Lord who has created he has created man from a clinging thing. Morsel-like lump or chewed flesh is the translation of the Arabic word mudga. Flesh is laham. A distinction needs to be made here. The embryo is initially a small mass. At a certain stage in its development, it looks to the naked eye like chewed flesh. The bone structure develops inside this mass in what is called the mesenchyma. The formed bones are covered in muscle the word laham applies to them. The Quranic description of the evolution of the embryo inside the uterus corresponds exactly to what we know today about it. As in verse 14, chapter 23. Then we created the sperm drop into a clinging thing. Then we created the clinging thing into a morsel-like lump. Then we created in the morsel-like lump bones. In his continuous sense of amazement, Bukai concludes that in more than a thousand years before our time, at a period when whimsical doctrines still prevailed, men had knowledge of the Quran. The statements it contains express in simple terms truths of primordial importance which man has taken centuries to discover. Verse 14, Chapter 23 Then we created the sperm drop into a clinging thing. Then we created the clinging thing into a morsel-like lump. Then we created in the morsel-like lump bones. Then we clothed the bones with flesh. Thus do we bring him forth as an entirely different creation. So blessed be God, the best of creators.
In his study of the basic process of the formation of the universe and the resulting composition of the worlds, Bukai comes upon two verses. The first is verse 30, chapter 21. Have those who disbelieve not seen by the knowledge they acquire that the heavens and the earth were conjoined as one mass, then we clove them asunder. One hundred and four years ago, a 26-year-old scientist in theoretical physics had proposed a theory called Special Relativity Theory. Albert Einstein's theory had scored in 1905 what was labeled the greatest scientific breakthrough since Isaac Newton's Principia of 1687. Following in the footsteps of Newton's laws, the relativity impacted a great many disciplines, including physics, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, natural philosophy, and, of course, religious studies. With his 1916 general relativity theory, Einstein had been called the forerunner of modern scientific revolution. His groundbreaking formula of mass energy equivalence, E equals mc squared, where E equals energy, m equals mass, and c the speed of light in a vacuum, implies that any small amount of matter contains a very large amount of energy. Some of this energy may be released as heat and light by nuclear transformations. The concept had led to the manufacture of atomic bombs just before World War II broke out. Almost one century has elapsed since Einstein's formula, best known as the Law of Mass Energy Exchange, was introduced. Today, a major breakthrough has just happened to prove Einstein was right both ways. But on the 20th of November, 2008, an international team led by Laurent LaRouche from the Center for Theoretical Physics in France managed to prove that the theory is actually right from a subatomic perspective. The group used a lot of computational power provided by some of the mightiest supercomputers in existence in order to prove that results based on proton and neutron, the particles that make up the atomic nuclei, behavior concur with the relativity theory. Practically, the standard model of quantum physics states that neutrons and protons are themselves made up of even smaller particles called quarks, which are bound together by particles named gluons. This basically states that mass and energy are equivalent. That is Einstein. But even more, energy can be transmuted into mass and vice versa. And that is new. Isn't this simply a physically sound explanation of the creation of the universe? The metaphysical question steps in. Who then had created and controlled the energy that transmutes into perceived mass? That is a question worthy of Isaac Newton. He posed his some 322 years ago, seeking an answer while scrutinizing the physical laws governing the solar system. The rudimentary answer he received was, God controls it all. Countless times did Maurice Bukai read the verse over and over in the early 70s. When only satisfied with his conclusions could he safely include them in his book, The Bible, the Quran, and Science, in 1976. The study of Arabic has proven quite useful for Bukai before reaching any conclusions. 
He says, in this verse we notice that the reference is made to a separation process, fatka, of a primary single mass, which elements were initially fused together, ratka. It must be noted that in Arabic, fatka is the action of breaking, diffusing, separating, and ratka is the action of fusing or binding together elements to make a homogeneous whole. Energy caused a mass to exist. Then the mass got blown up into energy with a bang, a big bang. The heavens and the earth were conjoined as one mass, then we clove them asunder. Only two words, mass, cleft, explain the creation of the universe as we know it today. And in complete accordance with what a host of theoretical physicists, astrophysicists, nuclear physicists, and mathematicians have reached throughout the 20th century and at the onset of the third millennium. Having studied the verse indicating the nuclear fusion that caused the creation of the universe, Bukai goes on to find in verse 11, chapter 41, an indication of the gaseous state of the universe after the mass got cleft. Then he addressed the heaven while it was yet smoke. Bukai writes, here is a statement of the existence of a gaseous mass with fine particles, for this is how the word smoke, dukan in Arabic, is to be interpreted. Smoke is generally made up of a gaseous substratum, plus, in more or less stable suspension, fine particles that may belong to solid and even liquid states of matter at high or low temperatures. He adds, the concept of the separation of a whole into several parts is noted in other passages of the Quran, with reference to multiple worlds. The second verse of the first chapter in the Quran reads, All praise is for God alone, Lord of all the worlds. Bukai concludes that the reference to multiple heavens and earths necessarily leads to the existence of multiple worlds. The word worlds is mentioned 73 times in the Quran. المعتقد أنه كان في وقت النبي الأرض في الوسط وحولها نجوم وحولها شمس تدور تدور بها عالم مضبوط ضيق معروف أين العالم وجمع عالمين هو جمع الجمع لأن يقال عالم Bukai highlights the concept of plurality, saying that modern astrophysicists consider it highly likely that planets similar to Earth are present in the universe. As far as the solar system is concerned, nobody seriously ponders the possibility of finding general conditions similar to those on Earth on another planet in this system. We must therefore look for them outside the solar system. We read in verse 12, chapter 65, God is the one who created seven heavens and of the earth, the like of them. Bukai derives directly from the verse saying, there are therefore many heavens and earths, and it comes as no small surprise to the modern reader of the Quran to find that earths such as our own may be found in the universe a fact that has not yet been verified by man in our time. There was no way for Bukai in 1998, the year he passed away, to follow up the ongoing research and search far and away from science fiction for terrestrial planets, whether that be in our galaxy, the Milky Way, or in the spacious universe. Even then, NASA scientists would not have been positively specific about the time breakdown of their venture. No one would have been sure that at the end of the decade, the agency would be able to launch a deep space telescope to grope out there for habitable planets like our own. 
In doing so, NASA scientists could finally overcome the extreme distance barrier hindering our quest for supposedly existing worlds. As Bukai put it in his revised 1993 edition of his book, The Bible, the Quran, and Science. Five, four, three, two, engine, engine start, one, zero, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. By the 6th of March, 2009, the long-anticipated project, Kepler mission, Search for Terrestrial Planets, has been launched to probe in outer space for a period of three and a half years. The telescope is named after Johannes Kepler, the German astronomer, astrologer, and mathematician best known for his euphonious laws of planetary motion published in 1609 and 1619. Until April 16th, the Kepler telescope has been transmitting pictures taken across its range of vision of 100 square degrees, a range of the size of a man's palm. The Kepler range of vision covers the stellar clusters of Cygnus and Lyra, housing some six and a half million stars. Of those, 100,000 to 200,000 stars are picked up to test their candidacy for the search for Earth-sized planets. That is, in our galaxy alone, let aside a universe where a number of potential planets might equal that of the stars. Had Bukai been alive today, his faith in the forceful truthfulness of the scientific signs in the Quran would have been elevated to some extraterrestrial heights. Out of the 200-some verses in which Bukai had detected a scientific sign, man's venture in space scores high. We read in verse 33, chapter 55. O fellowships of the jinn and of the humans, if you are able to penetrate through the outer spheres of the heavens and the earth, then do so penetrate them. Yet never shall you penetrate them but with an overwhelming authority. Bukai notes that this is one of three verses in the Quran that should command our full attention. This verse expresses, without any trace of ambiguity, what man should and will achieve in the field of space exploration penetrating the regions and diameters of heavens and earth. القطب لا يكون الا في كره والسماوات كلها كرات الكون كله وذلك بيسموه الكون الاحدب او القطب المغلق او المقفل على نفسه Because of his outstanding mastery of the Arabic language, Bukai could lay his hand on the denotations and connotations of three conditional modes. He explains the translation here calls for a bit of an explanation. The word if expresses in English a condition that is dependent upon a possibility and on either an achievable or an unachievable hypothesis. Arabic is a language which is able to introduce a much more explicit nuance into the conditional mode. There is one word to express the possibility, idha, another for the achievable hypothesis, in, and a third for the unachievable hypothesis expressed by the word Lao. The verse in question has it as an achievable hypothesis expressed by the word in. The Quran therefore suggests the material possibility of a concrete realization. This subtle linguistic distinction formally rules out the purely mystic interpretation some people have put on this verse. Bukai goes on to note that the verb to penetrate is the translation of the Arabic nafatha, followed by the preposition mean. According to Kazimierski's dictionary, the phrase means to pass right through and come out on the other side of a body, like an arrow that comes out on the other side. It therefore suggests a deep penetration and emergence at the other end into the heavenly regions and outer spheres.
Bukai continues, in complete accordance with Newton's metaphysics, to correctly read the meaning of the power, Sultan, that men should and will have to achieve this enterprise. The power would seem to come from the Almighty. Thanks to the powers of intelligence and ingenuity God gave to man to empower him to invent and to explore. يؤسفني كثير من علماء المسلمين في التلفزيون وفي الإذاعة يقول لك سلطان العلم هذا السلطان سلطان الله وسلطان الله له مركبتين المشيئة والقدرة ولازم الاثنين يتوافقان مع بعض القدرة موجودة والله قدر على كل شيء إذا توفرت المشيئة هيقدروا ينفذون بسلطان الله وليس بسلطان العلم There can be no doubt, Bukai concludes, that this verse indicates the possibility men will one day achieve what we today call perhaps rather improperly, the conquest of space. Bukai continues, in complete accordance with Newton's metaphysics, to correctly read the meaning of the power, Sultan, that men should and will have to achieve this enterprise. The power would seem to come from the Almighty. Thanks to the powers of intelligence and ingenuity God gave to man to empower him to invent and to explore. Bakai adds one final post note on this verse. One must observe here that the Quran does not only predict the penetration through the regions of the heavens, but also of the earth in an open call to travel through the depths of its diameters. Between the deep water realms and the outer space regions, the human wonder is ever insatiable. It might sound corny, but the view is really out of this world. Right. Beautiful view. The beauty of the place was uh, certainly not lost on me in this very remarkable location, beautiful location. And if the disbelievers of Mecca could manage to lift off into space, they would have been flabbergasted with more than wonder. Rather, even if we were to open for them a gate into the heaven above them, and they proceeded to ascend through it, still they would most surely say, It is but our eyes that have been bedazzled. Rather, we are a bewitched people. In these two verses, 14 and 15, chapter 15, God obviously refers to the disbelievers of Mecca, describing their reaction to the overwhelming sights they would have encountered if they were able to raise themselves up to the heavens. He alludes to a hypothesis which will never be realized for them. Bukai notes that in the presence of that impossible probability for the Meccans to see the unimaginable, the conditional sentence is introduced here by the word lao, which expresses a hypothesis that could never be materialized for the Meccan disbelievers, to fly high and touch the sky in overwhelming astonishment. Что я вижу? Это гигантский мир. Я полземного шара сразу видел, и видно было, как кривизна земли какая. Но самое большое впечатление на меня произвело это невозможное сочетание этого физического явления. Черное небо, яркое солнце. Bukai seems to be bedazzled himself on this ending note. Once more, it is difficult for me not to be impressed. When I read passages of the Quran under the light of modern science, the Quranic statements cannot simply be ascribed to the thought of a man who lived in the Arabian desert more than 14 centuries ago. And that we have made, every living thing therein, from water. Will they not then believe in God's oneness? From the Quran, I, I see that uh, uh, I could not find uh, something in contradiction with science. For there is not a single beast treading on the earth, nor a bird flying with its two wings, but they are communities like you. 
We have not neglected anything in the preserved book of heaven. Then they shall be assembled in the hereafter, before their Lord, with all people. Bukai's book, The Bible, the Quran, and Science, had scored enormous success since Francis Seger's publishing published the first edition in the summer of 1976. French editions continued to print almost annually, reaching an estimated 21 editions until 2008. Pocket Books Publishing circulated their first French edition of the book in 1986, then several prints till 1998 and continued later. The first English edition was published by Seger's Publishing in 1977 to total six editions until 1989. <laughs> العالمي الخامس للإعجاز العلمي في القرآن والسنة جلست أتحدث إليه فقال لي أصدقك أني عشت أياما لم أعش كمثلها إطلاقا عندما كنت أتأمل في هذه الحقائق التي تهزني The book was translated into German in three editions by 1989, 1994 and 2003 according to the catalog of the National Library of Germany. The Russian version appeared in 2000. The book also was translated into Indonesian and Serbo-Croatian as of 1978 until 2001. Then the book was printed in many editions into Gujarati, Bengali, Turkish, Urdu, and Persian since 1978. Eight Arabic publishing houses printed the book in many editions since 1978 till the present day. I suppose that my explanations are enough for everybody one who is objective and sincere to say the Quran cannot be the work of a man. An estimated 2 to 3 million copies of the French version and around 10 to 15 million copies in other languages were sold. The first French edition of his book what is the Origin of Man, the Answers of Science, and the Holy Scriptures, was published in 1981. Then four editions of it were published in English until 1989, followed by three translations into Arabic, Turkish, and Indonesian. Dr. Bukai had co-authored with Professor Muhammad al talabi in 1989 a book of Reflections on the Quran. In 1990, the English edition of Bukai's book, Mummies of the Pharaohs, Modern Medical Investigations, was published in New York. The Bible, the Quran, and Science was awarded in 1986 the French Golden Book Award. The French Academy awarded Dr. Maurice Bukai the History Award in 1988 in appreciation of his book, Mummies of the Pharaohs, Modern Medical Investigations, published in 1987. In 1991, the French National Academy of Medicine awarded Dr. Maurice Bukai a prize in appreciation of his medical and scientific contributions. The first French edition of Bukai's last book, Moses and Pharaoh, Hebrews in Egypt, has appeared in 1995. In the future, maybe after several decades, when I shall be a dead man, huh? many people uh, among the scientists to take into account compatibility between religions and science. In 1998, the year the author passed away, Maurice Bukai's book, The Bible, the Quran and Science, won the Book of the Month Award given to the bestseller books in France. Dr. Bukai's publishers denied the producer's information needed to document his publications. At the end of a series of persisting calls, an employee volunteered to send an email. She pointed out that the Bible, the Quran, and science was regularly reprinted in order to keep the bookshops provided. There were, she added, many editions, much more than ten, but couldn't say exactly because her database didn't have access to this information. The employee ended her message by saying that the editor who did know Maurice Bukai is Mr. Devai, but he died two years ago. Dr. Maurice Bukai's family refused to provide assistance in this production. 
Instead, Madame Bukai found it complimentary enough to mail the producers a brief note containing some already published information about his books and awards. She was kind enough to include a photo of her late husband. All biographical and career information about Dr. Bukai has been obtained through independent sources.